Greetings, mortal. Are you ready to die? By the mid-1990s, the first-person shooter genre was really kicking off. We'd had Doom in 1993, and a year later, Raven Software had also developed Heretic, which was basically Doom in a dark fantasy setting. Heretic was a pretty good game overall, but it couldn't really shake the similarities it had with its predecessor, which was something a lot of people pointed out at the time. And I mean, for good reason, even the weapons followed similar archetypes. A year later in 1995, though, they'd follow up Heretic with Hexen, another game running on the Doom engine and following on from the previous game's storyline. Now, although it was running on the same engine, this thing was about as far removed from Doom as it could possibly get, and is often regarded as being one of the most difficult games from around that time period. And I think what turns off a lot of people playing it is its less linear approach to the level design. You're not just moving around a single map anymore looking for that blue or red key to flip the end level switch. You're now moving back and forth between multiple levels all connected by a central hub. Activating switches would unlock new areas on entirely different maps. And a key that you find in one area would often be used to open a door in a completely separate area. At times you even needed to activate innocuous looking walls to proceed. What might be considered secret walls in any other shooting game. And this is why I think you don't see people talking about it all that much anymore because as good as it is, it's really not as accessible as something like Doom or even Heretic in terms of the base gameplay. It's the kind of thing that separates the boys from the men and I even think that's part of why I find it so appealing is because so few people actually seem to fully appreciate it. I've even seen people refer to it as the Dark Souls of first person shooters, which makes no sense to me, seeing as Hexen came out 16 years prior, so I mean if anything, Dark Souls is the Hexen of action role playing games. But it is a good way to describe Hexen on the whole, I guess if you had to dumb the whole thing down. So if by comparing something to Dark Souls you're implying that it's gothic, challenging, open ended, at times confusing but ultimately rewarding, then yeah. I guess you could call Hexen the Dark Souls of FPS. This is a game that's going to take every opportunity to punish you. Even the most basic enemies, these two-headed dog creatures named Ettens, can easily swarm you and kill you within seconds. Nowhere in this game is safe. Little flying enemies called Afrits populate the sky shooting fireballs at you relentlessly. Even the water is filled with deadly creatures called stalkers, get out of here stalker, that pop up quickly to take a chunk out of you. On the ground you'll deal with the chaos serpents, which kind of look like the violator from spawn. Centaurs armed with shields and the dark bishops, which are kind of like the disciples of the sparrow from heretic. Spooky looking monk dudes who hover around and launch spiraling fireballs. And if that ain't enough, there's the odd boss fight too. Hexen's challenge though doesn't really lie in its enemies, I mean yeah the enemies in this game are going to wreck your shit if you're not careful, but more so it's in the actions you have to complete to progress. This is a super confusing game at times and I can't even imagine it would be possible to beat it without a walkthrough. I first played Hexen when my dad picked up a copy of the game from Harvey Norman, and I remember playing through it and getting stuck on the very first level. After a while I managed to make it to the second hub, but things didn't really get any better. In the second hub of the game, you're required to move back and forth between three separate portals to find and activate six switches which opens up a door in the main map. In the third hub, you've got to activate nine switches across six different portals, along with finding four separate keys. Yeah, and there's still three more hubs to go after this one. This was a lot different to what I'd done in Doom and Heretic, simply running around the map until I'd found all the keys. It wasn't until when I was in my teens when I went back and played this, mostly during my computer studies class in high school, that I finally managed to beat the whole thing, obviously with the help of a walkthrough. Now what used to take me 10 or so hours I can beat within roughly 2 or 3, but that doesn't change the fact that this is a really confusing game. There's no shame in having to use a guide to get through this thing and I think that really highlights how it's in a league of its own. The story follows on from the events in Heretic, so basically the story in this universe is that there's three serpent riders who are kind of similar to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, in that they just spell out death and destruction for anyone who gets in their way. These guys cross through dimensions and just fuck with everyone and everything, controlling and ultimately destroying entire civilizations for just shits and giggles. In the first game you're playing as a lone elf named Corvus and the serpent rider that you defeated was Disparal. Now in Hexen it's a guy called Korax, and eventually in Hexen 2, which is in a league of its own, it was Eidolon. 
Korax has set up shop in an entirely new dimension, the world of Kronos. All you really need to know though is that your ultimate goal is to kill him, along with everything else that gets in your way. My servants can smell your blood, human. Choosing who to play as is the first choice you've got to make, and it can have a pretty huge effect on how the game plays out. You're basically choosing between three classes here. Now you've got the warrior who favors melee weapons, the mage who favors spells, and then the cleric who's kind of a combination of both. Each character has three weapons, a starting weapon that never runs out, then a second and a third weapon that uses blue and green mana, then finally a fourth weapon that uses both mana sources at once. But you've first got to find the three parts for it throughout each hub. The Warrior Baratus is the middle of the road and the easiest one to get used to. He's got high speed, high armor and strength which makes him the most resilient. You start off with nothing but this guy's gauntlets to defend yourself with. And that alone is kind of awesome in concept, I mean this guy's heading in to save the world with nothing but his bare hands, it's kind of badass. Thing is though, you'll soon learn that his fists pack a hell of a wallop. Now this thing works in three hits. The first two hits are jabs, followed by a haymaker that does extra damage. It won't take too long to come across Timon's axe, no, not that Timon. And even though it's one of the earliest weapons you'll get, you'll be using this bad boy right up until the end of the game. You can swing this thing pretty quickly and it does great damage, only using up a few mana per hit. Not only that, but the range for this thing is further than you'd think, meaning you can dish out damage without even really taking any in return. In the third slot, you've got the Hammer of Retribution, the kind of thing that would make Thor green with envy. Taking up half the goddamn screen, this thing launches out a flaming hammer that spins around in the air as it flies towards enemies, even doing a bit of splash damage. Like the Axe 2, when you're out of mana, you can still use these weapons, they just do bugger all damage. In fact, they're the only mana based weapons in the entire game you can do this with. The fourth weapon though is a bit of a letdown. Now this thing is a magic flaming sword called Quietus that fires out five projectiles in a small arc. The problem is that to really use it effectively, you've got to have a bit of distance between you and what you're trying to hit to give the projectiles time to spread properly. But even then it just doesn't do as much damage as you'd hope it would. An ultimate weapon like this should be able to spell doom and gloom for your enemies. Should be able to tear them all to shit at the cost of using up your resources quickly. Quietus doesn't really tear up anything or seem to burn through mana that quickly, it just somehow fails entirely. Now I always think this might have been done intentionally, seeing as the warrior's second and third weapon are so effective, but it is a bit of a letdown when you first get this thing and just see how underwhelming it is. Next up we've got Dylon, who's the mage, and this guy's the spellcaster. He starts off with a Sapphire Wand, which kind of resembles the Elven Wand from Heretic, only it never runs out of ammo. The first spell he gets is Frost Shards, and I've always kind of been on the fence with this one. Now, on paper it does sound pretty good, it launches out a bunch of Frost Shards that will eventually freeze enemies. After a few more seconds of being frozen, they'll then shatter. It has a neat effect too where if you freeze a flying enemy, as they fall and hit the ground, they'll shatter automatically, which I always thought was really cool. The thing is, I always just found this weapon to be really underpowered, and the hindrance of frozen enemies always blocking your movement is more of a handicap than a benefit. Against the centaurs, this thing can be a nightmare because it deflects the projectiles right back at the player, which, you know, kinda sucks. Dylon's third weapon is the Ark of Death, which would make a really good name for a metal band. Luckily though, this thing is great, and it's probably my second favorite weapon in the entire game. Not only does it look awesome, I mean you've literally got lightning in your hands, but it's really effective too. Right, so with this thing you shoot out a lightning bolt which locks onto enemies and fries them for a few seconds, hopefully killing them in the process. Centaurs can't block this attack either, which makes it really good against them. Fucking hate these things. Sadly, the Mage's fourth weapon also kinda sucks, and this honestly might be the crappiest weapon in the entire game, after the Cleric's Mace. This again, sounds good on paper. You fire this thing and it launches out three balls, which home in on enemies and explode for extra splash damage. But the damage this thing does just seems to be really inconsistent, and it absolutely chews through mana like a pothead through a bag of Doritos. Sometimes it seems to work really well, then other times it feels like you're flushing your mana down the toilet. 
Maybe it's got something to do with the hit detection, who knows. But there's times when it just feels like it's passing through enemies entirely and doing absolutely bugger all. Overall, I've always found the mage to be the weakest of the playable characters. The only really good weapon he has is the Ark of Death. I mean, everything else is kind of meh. Finally, we've got the Cleric, and this guy is packing some serious heat. He's like the Dirk Diggler of old school first person shooter characters, walking around with a 12 inch monster in his trousers. Firstly, Pariah starts off with the crappy Mace of Contrition, which may as well be called the Mace of Attrition, because it takes so many hits to kill even the weakest of enemies with this thing. It'd be more effective bludgeoning someone to death with a chicken drumstick. Finding his next weapon, the Serpent Staff in the second hub is like coming across an oasis packed with Victoria's Secret models, cocaine and single malt scotch. I mean, the Serpent Staff isn't amazing, but it's a far heap better than the Mace. It has a pretty good firing rate, chews through mana pretty slowly, and has the added benefit of giving health back to the player if you're attacking at point blank range. Overall, not too bad. Thirdly, you've got the Firestorm. Now visually, this thing looks badass. Parisa's hands are covered in flames and glittering, and he fires out this blast that hits enemies, then burns them for a couple of seconds afterwards. Only problem is the hit detection is a bit wonky and sometimes it might take two shots to take something down, then other times it might take three or four. It seems to have something to do with the auto aim and it's a problem that I've always had with this game. And funnily enough, the Firestorm is also what I call my bow movements after having turkey chili. Finally though, we come to the cream of the crop with the Wraith Verge. Now this is the best weapon in the entire game. In fact, it's probably one of the best weapons in any first person shooter ever. People always talk about the BFG from Doom when they're talking about the gun to end all guns, but this thing right here, I'd argue, is even better. Alright, so Wraith Verge is the cleric's final weapon, and what this thing does is fire out a bunch of wraiths that seek out enemies and pretty much rip them to pieces. All you've got to do is fire the weapon and the spirits home into anything hostile and do the rest. It's beautiful. What's funny about this weapon too is that even though it uses the most mana to fire, you'll save more mana in the long run because you only need to fire it once or twice to empty an entire room. I like to think too that the race are the spirits of the people who lost their lives during the Serpent Riders conflict, and are now coming back to enact revenge on those that killed them, and as the cleric you're giving them the means to do so. The sound this thing makes too is amazing. You just hear all these shrieking wraiths as they fly around and tear your enemies to pieces. I mean, it is so fucking metal. There's not really a right or wrong character to go with, but I'd suggest if it's the first time you're playing it, maybe start with the warrior, then try again with the cleric and finally the mage. Now, Hexen is one of the few games to run on the Doom Engine, or the id Tech 1 if you want to get technical, and with the possible exception of some errors in Strife, I'd say this is the best the engine has ever looked, outside of modding, obviously. The variety with the environments here is what really sells it. The first main hub in the game has you moving through three separate portals, each with the distinct theme of ice, fire, and steel, and all three of these areas are vastly different visually you'll see neat little effects like leaves blowing across the ground. There's fog and mist in the swamplands and sewers and animated skyboxes. And that spooky bridge you cross for the final fight against Korax is just drenched in atmosphere. It's even got an early example of basically scripted sequences, like this bit here when these enemies drop through the skylights. It was impressive stuff back in the day and it's the sort of visuals now that give indie developers wet dreams. It's kind of funny how graphics have done this weird renaissance with this stuff being more appreciated now and those early 3D shooters looking the more worse for wear. My favourite effects in this game are all the elemental effects for the weapons, the fire, the ice and the lightning. It just looks gorgeous and it's animated so well. People who say that video games can't be art have obviously never seen the sprite work for the Ark of Death. If I had to change one thing about Hexen, it would without a doubt be the Centaurs. In a game where enemies are enjoyably challenging and fun to fight, the Centaurs are like the complete opposite. They're annoying, frustrating, tedious enemies that do little more than just waste your time. Now the Centaurs have a shield and after taking damage, they hold up the shield and deflect any damage for like two or three seconds. Doesn't matter how much damage they take, if they take a hit, that shield is coming up faster than you can say hurt me plenty. 
This sounds fine in theory, but later on in the game, you fight these things in droves, easily dozens at a time, and it just becomes incredibly time consuming to kill them all. If that's not enough, the ones you come up against later in the game are tougher variants called Slaughtars, who can also fire off projectiles from their shields as well without any real kind of warning. So often you can't even tell if they're just blocking attacks or shooting at you. With a weapon like the Wraith Verge, these things are a joke. But with any other character and for all the earlier hubs, they're easily the worst part about the game. And I just dread coming up against them in certain areas. The only other thing I really wish they'd added into Hexen was the option to bind your items to specific buttons on the keyboard. Hexen brings back a lot of items from Heretic for the player to use. You've got your basic Quartz Flasks, which refills 25 health points. You can push enemies back with the Discs of Repulsion, teleport them away with the Banishment Device, or teleport yourself away with the Chaos Device. You can instantly refill all of your health or mana with the Mystic Urn or the Crater of Might. You can even summon in a Minotaur to help you out in combat. Throw out that little power up like it's a Pokeball and watch this Alpha Chad just spawn in. One of the most common offensive items is the Flesh Shed, which is a bit like the Time Bomb of the Ancients from Heretic, and it has different results depending on which character's using it. The Warrior throws it out like a grenade, for the Mage he drops it like a Time Bomb, and with the Cleric it explodes and leaves behind a damaging gas cloud. Again, much like my bowel movements after Turkey Chili. The only thing it's missing is the Tome of Power, which was brought back oddly enough for Hexen 2. Anyway, my point is, the only way to use any of these items is to scroll through your inventory and then select them manually. You can't just like bind the flask to F or something or the flesh yet to G. It just makes using these items in a pinch kinda tricky, and I really wonder why they never configured this in, considering you can bind commands for pretty much every other single mechanic in the goddamn game. Another more serious issue though, is that Hexen is a game that can quite literally break at times. A lot of levels have heavily scripted sequences like doors or events that are supposed to activate after you stand in a specific area or flip some kind of switch. But there's times though when these actions simply don't work. This can actually break a map and make it impossible to beat and unless you've got some kind of old safe old handy, well, you're pretty much up shit creek. You want to know the craziest thing is that Hexen 2 is even more hardcore than this. The puzzles in Hexen 2 make the puzzles in Hexen 1 look like a baby's block toy in comparison. It's like going from pushing the round shape through the round hole to understanding quantum physics. I did a video on Hexen 2 a while back which I think summed it up perfectly, so go watch that. Raven Software, I think, ultimately turned out another really high quality product with Hexen. And though people might not like its level design, I don't think you can really deny that it's a bit of a masterpiece. The sprite work for the weapons and the architecture for the levels is still amazing and varied. Kevin Shoulder does a really good job too with the music, with some memorable tracks here that are a lot better to listen to than some of the grating stuff he did for Heretic. The whole thing has a suitably dark and gritty atmosphere that still shines through over 20 years later. There's just this fantastic sense of hopelessness and despair in this game, which is fitting considering you're playing as humanity's last hope. And the ending's gonna leave you thirsty for more. Worship me, and I may yet be merciful. I consider Hexen as important to the shooter genre as games like Doom, Quake, and Half-Life. It's challenging, unforgiving, and relentless at times, but ultimately I think super rewarding. And it's influenced countless other games that came after it. And if you do manage to finish this thing, you can join the highly exclusive club with the 12 other people who also managed to do the same. And besides, you're not a true boomer until you do. Yeah.